Shannon Baptist Church exists to make, mature, and multiply disciples of Jesus Christ one life at a time in the Midlands and beyond. Hi everyone, I'm Dawn D. Mercer Plank, and I am pretty sure you know the children's song, Jesus Loves Me. You know the lyrics, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Now while it's a song kids sing, that line in there is today's focus of our Shannon Plus podcast, for the Bible tells me so. How do we have confidence in what the Bible says? Here to answer that is our senior pastor, Dr. Daniel Dickard, and a Columbia-based attorney who also now is on staff at Shandon, Rhett Kendall. Rhett is the discipleship director of adults. Now, Rhett, you grew up in Greenville, went to Furman. That's where you met your beautiful wife, Nancy. Give us a little bit more about your background. Well, after I graduated, I, I did move to Columbia in um, 1992 or uh, 1990, and then joined the church right about then. Uh, spent I've spent the last uh, 32 years here, and absolutely love the church. Uh, along the way, I've been uh, able to be involved in our Sunday group or Sunday school programs. I've uh, worked with our teachers and uh, done done a lot of things. Had a lot of fun also as a lawyer. Uh, it's given me a lot of opportunity to meet people and to uh, be engaged in our community. So you're still a practicing attorney. I am. But you're also on staff now with us. That's right. That's right. Uh, <laughs> because I, you needed something else on your calendar, That's I guess. right. But, uh, you know, I've always taken the perspective that uh, I've, I was in ministry. Uh, I've been in ministry all along. Uh, and now they gave me a uh, employee ID. So. There you go. You've got a key to get <laughs> key in the to door. The now. There you go. Well, we're so glad that you are on staff here at Shandon. Um, today, Daniel, we, we want to emphasize that the last few podcasts, we've been looking at the importance of being a disciple maker. Now, you believe strongly that in order to be confident in doing that, we have to be confident in the Bible. So how can we as Christians be confident in what is written within the pages of a Bible. Dondi, the shallowization of the church stems from the minimization of the Bible. What I mean by that is a shallow church holds a minimized view of the Bible, but a strong church and strong believers preach a perfect one. We often say here that a confident disciple maker is confident in the Bible. I think of Billy Graham. Many of our listeners would know who Billy Graham is or was. And Billy Graham was known for this famous tag phrase, the Bible says, and then he would preach. And there was this underlying confidence that when you heard a message from Dr. Graham, that it was ultimately a message from the Bible or a message from God. But how do we know that the Bible is connected to the very words of God. It's my belief, Dondi, that the good preaching is teaching people how to read the Bible for themselves, and to the inverse, that the height of arrogance is thinking that we have something more to say than what is already in God's Word. As a pastor, people don't need my man-made opinions or human anecdotes. They don't need my secular platitudes. What they need is to hear from God. But how do they know that they're hearing from God? So let me, just very quickly for our listeners, let me give you several verses that I think that will challenge you and help you when it comes to your walk with the Lord and having confidence in the Bible. Second Peter Peter chapter 1 verse 21 says this, that no prophecy or no word was spoken by man alone, but men who were moved by the Holy Spirit, talking about those human writers in Scripture. We believe that there is one Lord Jesus Christ. There is one main thought of Scripture, and that's salvation that comes through Christ Jesus. There is one problem, and that is sin. But we believe that the Bible, which was written over a 1,500-year period on three continents, in three languages, 40 human authors, but one divine author, the Holy Spirit, who lifted all of these human writers, whether that be Paul, John, the various writers of Scripture, that lifted them above error. So here's something that I often like to say, Dondi. God has revealed himself in Christ. Christ is revealed in the Scriptures. Therefore, we preach the Bible. So let's do a little bit of reverse engineering here. First of all, God has revealed himself in Christ. If you want to know what God looks like, 
and what God the Father is about, look to Jesus Christ the Son. That's what the scriptures tell us. So God has revealed himself in Christ. But then Christ is revealed in the scriptures. Jesus himself said there in John chapter 5 that the scriptures testify about me. Or there in Luke chapter 24 on the road to Emmaus, Jesus post-resurrection is walking with two disciples. And the Bible says this in Luke 24. And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So God has revealed himself in Christ. Christ is revealed in the scriptures. We learn about the Lord through the scriptures. Therefore, we preach the Bible. So if we're going to be confident as a disciple maker... Our confidence comes from the Lord, but how do we know about the Lord? It's by getting into the Bible, the Word of God. As Billy Graham would say, the Bible Bible says. says. I love that. You know, Rhett, you've been teaching the Bible, the Word of God, for a long time. I'm curious, with you being an attorney, what are some of the similarities and differences you see that exist between the law of the land and the Word of God? Well, I think... The, the one of the similarities in terms of how we relate to it is to we have to accept the laws of the land and scripture as authority and so the fact that um, it is true and the fact that it is uh, sovereign is uh, true of both the law of the land and uh, us now we, we may disagree with either of them but ultimately it is the the written statement the law uh, maybe maybe it's a law that's been passed by Congress or, or some other form of law, or it's uh, as we look at scripture, we, we ha- discipleship starts with a recognition that we have to accept that authority, submit to that authority, and seek to live it out, to follow it. And so that is also the, the, the what we talk about in um, uh, with civil law. We are subject subject to it as citizens of the United States. Uh, we didn't get to write it, but we're bound to follow it. Now the other part, I think that there's a similarity. And again, this is uh, in terms of how we relate to the Scripture, is this, that Scripture and civil law speak to us about, how, about right relationships. In order for us to function as a society, we look to the civil law to determine what, are our, what will our relationships be, both to the government and to each other. We are bound by uh, speed laws, by property laws, by uh, all of those types of things that tell us how we relate to each other. Well, Scripture does that too. It not only tells us how we relate to the sovereign, but it also speaks to us as to how to relate to each other. So both in terms of, of the authority that they place in our lives and the content that tells us how to live in relationships, I think those might be some parallels. Obviously, as far as differences, it's the source. Uh, yeah. the, the source is uh, ultimately uh, God's Word uh, is uh, given to us uh, by the Holy Spirit, um, and therefore it is uh, the highest authority. Uh, fortunately, uh, we don't often have to choose, but but the Word of God will always prevail over the laws of man. You know, let's go with that a little bit. I'm going to test your apologetics, both of you. When we talk about the source of God, oftentimes when we talk about the validity of the Bible and what's in there, one of the main things we hear is people will say, well, it contradicts itself. It's written by man. Or I've even seen a billboard that said the Bible's still being written, meaning some of the things that are in there that God says, well, it should be this way. People are trying to change it. No, now it's this way. How do you answer that? Yeah, several things I would say there, Don. First of all, the Scripture says not to add to or to take away from the Scriptures. Um, The Bible says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, so God will never contradict His Word for the will of mankind. But I think we also have to go back and understand, how did we get the scriptures? And so there's a great book that has been written, Greg Gilbert, Why Trust the Bible. It's only about 120 pages. I commend it to all of our listeners. But when the Bible was first written, or the individual letters that we had, whether that be from Paul or I think about John, others who wrote uh, letters within Scripture, we don't have the original autographs, that being the first copy. But what we have is thousands upon thousands of manuscripts. In fact, there are more manuscripts or copies of biblical texts than we have of the Odyssey, of the Iliad, of any literature in human history. 
And as you begin to compare these together, you'll see that there are no theological distinctions. Now, you might have someone like Bart Ehrman, who was someone who was against the Bible. He was an atheist, and he would say, well, what about all of these, what he would call manuscript errors? Well, we're talking about not the original autograph. Instead, we're talking about a copyist that may have not crossed the T or dotted an I. But you take all of those so-called discrepancies. Bart Ehrman would say there are 400,000, but they've done a study and they've they've gone through all of those so-called discrepancy, and there is not one theological um, distinction or change in theology of doctrine, even from those uh, copyists. So all Christians should affirm that the original autograph was perfect. Why? Because Second Peter 1 tells us so. But then as we look at these later copies that we even see the accuracy of these manuscripts. I mean, it really is amazing that all of these manuscripts that we have, and yet they all point to one truth. And then as you even see how the Bible has been translated from language to language. We probably all remember that game when we were little where you would pass it from. That's that's exactly right, operator. And yet when you go to pick up God's Word today, you can trust that it is the Word of God. And so I could get into the weeds here of, you know, how the Bible was formed, uh, you know, and what were the requirements for the formation of the Bible. There was actually a fourfold, what we would call threshold. We won't get into all the weeds today, but I would encourage listeners to go and read uh, that book, Why Trust the Bible. There are other great ones in defense of the Bible. Uh, Erwin Lutzer has written a great book on seven reasons that you should trust the Bible. But but I think, as Spurgeon used to say, you don't have to defend the Bible like a lion. You let the Bible be unleashed, and it'll defend itself. Awesome. What would you add to that, Rhett? I, I, I take a very practical view of um, of how we uh, choose to accept the authority of the Scripture. And I think if you come at it from the outside, uh, as as he said, let uh, and attack the Scripture, you can always nitpick things. But when you live the Scripture, when you accept the Scripture as authority, and you accept it as the Word of God, it will reveal its truth to you. Mm. The Bible tells us that, um, that the uh, non-believer cannot understand the Scripture because they're not spiritually apprised. We have to partner with the Holy Spirit. So while I also will say... I don't understand the Bible fully, and we will not understand the Bible fully. There are some points that have to be held in tension until in tension until um, we are we are uh, with the Father and we can ask the questions. Mm-hmm. But uh, for now, I, I think we have to uh, start from a, pati- a, a position of belief and allow the Scriptures to form us, rather than seeking to conform it into something that we find agreeable, we find acceptable, or even that we find understandable. And the bottom line, being practical as as you have been, nothing proves to be truer in our own personal lives when we walk with the Lord and we see what His Word says versus what the world tells us. One of the tests of truth that you hear people talk about is, is, uh, or uh, propositional statements and whether they are true, is in how well they fit over time with the reality that you experience. And people who, who live in the Bible, who get into God's Word, find that it does address the everyday of life. It does uh, give guidance that's meaningful. It does answer the questions that they struggle with. And so that proves its own value and truth because of that. And that's been occurring now for over 2,000 years. Rhett, you and Daniel have been emphasizing so much here at Shandon the need for healthy discipleship. And as we look at what drives healthy discipleship in a church, LifeWay Research had made five observations when they had studied it. They said, one, discipleship is intentional. Two, groups matter a lot. Three, the discipline of Bible engagement impacts every other discipline. Four, there's a deep connection between discipleship and evangelism. But what I want to hit is number five. They said what is most telling in their research of what drives healthy discipleship in a church is reading the Bible, that that matters more than anything else, and having the confidence in that Bible. You guys, I had taught Sunday school at a Columbia church several years back, and when I pulled up in the parking lot, I noticed as people were coming in, no one was carrying in a Bible. 
Now, I know there are people here at our church that don't because they can read it on their phone. That's become very commonplace. Nothing wrong with that. At this church, though, years ago, before people really pulled it up on their phone, I went into the class, and when I said, because, of course, when I teach, I want to look up Scripture. I want different people to participate. And I was really struck by when I said to the person who had invited me there, do you have any Bibles? And they started looking in the cabinets of the classroom to find a Bible. And it broke my heart because I thought, I'm trying to read the, ex- explain and teach the Bible, but they don't even have one in their hands. For someone listening who doesn't have a Bible or who's not a Bible reader, where would you encourage them to start in the Bible? Because as you mentioned, Rhett, it takes the Holy Spirit helping us understand the Scriptures. But do they start at Genesis? Because they can get really overwhelmed with some of what's in there. Find a Bible reading plan that fits you and start somewhere. There are a lot of great Bible reading plans Some plans are what I would call of medium difficulty, maybe five days a week. That way you give yourself a little bit of grace period over the weekend. Maybe you start by reading a proverb or a psalm a day, or maybe that you want to read the entire Bible through the year. But I think that good preaching is teaching people how to handle the Bibles for themselves. Donna, you would know every Sunday when I get up to preach, there are a couple things I always say. I love it, too. First thing I say is, good morning, Shandon family. Mm -hmm. And I do that intentionally because I want those uh, who are listening to know you are part of God's family. You are not just a participant or a consumer, you are family, and we we love well as a family. So and then the second thing you is, say... If you have your Bible... And I hope that you do. I invite you to open it with me. And that phrase, and I hope that you do, it's a reminder that what you are about to hear does not come from me. My job as a preacher is to explain and apply the Word of God. I believe in what's called expository preaching. Now, someone at the church that I previously served at said, well, pastor, what's this suppository preaching that you're in? I was like, no, no, we're not talking about suppository <laughs> preaching, expository. Uh, a very different, a yeah. very, And what we mean by that is to pull out the meaning so the Bible was written to give us principles for how to live for the Lord, but then pull it out, and then apply it to our life. So if you have your Bible, and I hope that you do, because the message does not come from me, the message comes from a much greater authority, and it's not just hearing the Bible on Sunday. You know, there's an old Southernism that we, uh, you know, hear, which says this, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a Day. day, but if you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. lifetime. Mm-hmm. In the same way, if someone just comes to consume on a Sunday morning one message a week, that's just giving them the fish for the day. But if good preaching is teaching people how to read the Bible for themselves, they will feed themselves for a lifetime. Awesome. Uh, you know, it. you asked about where to start. Mm-hmm. I, I think a couple things that people can do. First of all, the pastor uses the phrase, uh, open your Bible. That I, I encourage strongly to have a printed Bible and use that as your primary uh, reference. Digital Bibles are great for convenience, for travel, but when you want to embrace the Word of God, having it in front of you as a printed text, you don't have to update your iOS. Your battery never dies. It is, is something you will learn to you love. You can write your notes you in Put the your notes columns. in there. You can hand it off to your children. It becomes a treasure for you. So first of all, have a, have a real Bible. Uh, I think the second thing is, for especially as you're beginning, is start with a a, a translation or a version of the Bible that's easier to read. We often uh, hear from ESV or from the NASB, but there are, there are versions of the Scripture that are written in a way that is much more easy to uh, approach for those who aren't as familiar. And I would recommend, uh, whether it's an NIV, I think the, the, um, the Christian NLT, Standard, the NLT, yeah. for general reading, those are great. Uh, and I would encourage folks start there, and then st- um, and then find a have a strategy for it, not just flop it open and see where you are. Excellent. I'm curious with you guys, with us loving the Word of God, 
what would you say are your top two favorite books of the Bible that have meant the most to you? Granted, depending on what we're going in, different seasons of our life, a particular book might touch us more than another. But my favorites, I'd say over time, for me, the book of Habakkuk, which Mm. people are like, Habakkuk, (laughs) you know, a prophet in the Old Testament. It's only three chapters, but it's one of my favorite books and I think just applies to life in general. And then Philippians in the New Testament, definitely four chapters looking at the joy that Paul was able to have, the way he disconnected himself from whatever trial or anything he was going through, and just knew his sole job in life was to be joyful because of being able to serve Christ. So Habakkuk and Philippians would be my top two. Daniel? Mine would be Romans, what some folks have called the Magna Carta of the faith. Romans is my favorite book to read Mm. because it moves from doctrine and theology, new life in Christ, sanctification, into just being very practical. But my favorite book to preach is actually the book that we are in right now, the book of James. Mm. I love Love the book of James. It's been called the Proverbs of the New Testament, and it's just so practical. And in five chapters, there's just so much that God has to say to us about how we can apply truth to our life. Rhett, what would your top two be? Um, the book of Ephesians is uh, my favorite uh, book for both for myself and to teach. Uh, structurally, it's a great book because it of the way it's divided uh, so evenly between uh, straight doctrine and the application of that doctrine. Uh, but it also is such a book uh, that reveals how God uh, regards us. And the the turning point in chapter two, where it says it tell, reminds us that you know formerly we were, and it goes through and tells us uh, what our former life looked like. And then it has uh, the, the the greatest phrase I think in the Bible says, "But God," mm-hmm. uh, and and it speaks to what how He then raises us up and and seats us with uh, His Son, and He does that for the purpose of showing to the world how gracious He is. And I just think that's an amazing picture. And then, and then, such a practical application of that in verse chapters four and, and following, uh, and telling us how to live out this uh, high calling uh, that that we have been given. Um, and then, you know, uh, pieces and parts of, of Psalms. Some of them um, are, <laughs> you know, you get in the you get into the the trough with uh, David and his struggles, mm-hmm. but uh, others are so uplifting. So I do enjoy um, going through Psalms uh, as, as when I'm in my quiet times and in my times of really needing to uh, come into the presence of God. So for those of you listening, if you haven't been a Bible reader or maybe you have in the past, but you need to get back into it, why don't you check out some of the books we just mentioned? Habakkuk and Psalms would be in the Old Testament, and then Philippians, Romans, James, and Ephesians are found in the New Testament. But we're going to keep Rhett Kendall around for next week's podcast. He's going to join us as Daniel and I look at how we as Christians need to be more people-focused and not so program-centered. Enjoy reading your Bible today, everyone. Thanks for being with us. I'm Dawn D. Mercer Plank for Shannon Plus Podcast. And I'm Daniel Dickard, Senior Pastor of Shannon Baptist Church, signing off. We'll see you next week.